Catholic sports, this is from Crooks, talking about the Catholic pulse. It's a very good source. Catholic sports is not just about wins, but it's for the common good. So sport is for the common good. Okay, what does that mean? Practically speaking, this approach led to the development of religious cultures in medieval Europe in which games and sport were engaged in on feast days and Sundays. And their incorporation in the schools of the humanists and early Jesuits during the Renaissance. All right, so this mode of thinking today is carried forward in the world by who? Tell me the school system or the university system that is not involved in sports. Because they're all on the Jesuit model of learning against learning. So sports is an integral part. What day is the great sports day or the great sport days? Saturdays and Sundays. This heritage influenced Catholic schools in the United States, which incorporated time and space for young people to play games and sport from the start in the mid-19th century. The theological underpinning for the acceptance of play and sport had to do with the understanding of the material world as good. Just run that by me again. In order to do these things like sport, you have to understand that we are really what? Good. This world is good. What does the Bible say about this world? It's wicked. The love of this world is what? Enmity towards God. So you can see it's a totally different mindset. You're on another planet here. And this sport becomes part of the common good. If you look at all the great sports teams, well, most of them are owned by Knights of Malta. They're all Catholic owned. And if you look at the World Cup and all of those issues, well, they are founded on Roman Catholic principles. It was Jules Rimet, the Frenchman, who gave his name to the statuette that Bobby Moore rather shyly held aloft as he was carried in his teammates' shoulders in Wembley sunshine all those years ago. So this is the World Cup. It is a Roman Catholic invention. As a devout Catholic, the rerum novarum issue, in other words, equalizing the playing field, taking from the rich and giving to the poor, making everyone on the same level. And for that, you have to create the chaos. You have to create so much hatred against the rich. Exactly the same situation that you had in the French Revolution, right? And the spirit of prophecy says that what happened in the French Revolution will be repeated on a global scale. So here we have it. And how do you keep these masses happy? To give them sport. He already said he's not going to distribute them so that you are well off after this distribution. It's just there's nobody that's rich anymore to get angry with. But the little that you have, will you please pay it when you go to the sports stadium to go berserk so that you can empty your pocket once more to make these people even more rich while you are now not alone living in poverty, but those that were rich are also now in poverty and can't even employ you because they don't have any money anymore. So we're all level on the playing field. This is communist social justice thinking. It has been developed in the think tanks of Jesuitical thinking. Spirit of prophecy. There is such a thing as leaning heavily on men and lightly on God. Those in charge of our schools should put into active service every talent possessed by the students that can be used for the help of the school. When this is done, as it should be, it will be found that students will not hanker for football, tennis, and other amusements. What the students need to be taught is how to make themselves as useful as possible wherever they may be placed. They should learn how to adapt themselves to the work in hand. Christ said, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. In the night season, I was witness to the performance that was carried on at the school grounds, talking about one of our schools. The students who engaged in the grotesque mimicry that was seen acted out the mind of the enemy. Some were 
in a very unbecoming manner. A view of the things was presented before me in which the students were playing games of tennis and cricket. Then I was given instruction regarding the character of these amusements. They were presented to me as a species of idolatry. Like idols of the nations, there were more than visible spectators on the ground. Satan and his angels were there making impressions on human minds. Angels of God who ministered to those who shall be heirs of salvation were also present, not to approve, but to disapprove. They were shamed that such an exhibition should be given by the professed children of God. The forces of the enemy gave the decided victory, and God was dishonored. He who gave his life to refine, ennoble, and sanctify human beings was grieved at the performance. Cricket? Baseball? Is this real? Some of the most popular amusements such as football and boxing have become schools of brutality. In this month alone, two boxers have died as a result of this brutality. They are developing the same characteristics that did the games of the ancient Romans. The love of domination the pride, the mere brute force, the reckless disregard of life are exerting upon the youth a power to demoralize that is appalling. Other athletic games, though not as brutalizing, are scarcely less objectionable because of the excess to which they are carried. They stimulate the love of pleasure and excitement, thus fostering a distaste for useful labor, a disposition to shun practical duties and responsibilities. They tend to destroy a relish for life's sober realities and its tranquil enjoyments. Thus the door is open to dissipation and lawlessness with their terrible results. Whatever is done under the sanctified stimulus of Christian obligation, because you are stewards in trust of talents to use to be a blessing to yourselves and others, give your substantial satisfaction for all that is done to the glory of God. I cannot find an instance in the life of Christ where he devoted time to play and amusement. Show it to us. Is it anywhere in the, in the Bible? Now, I want you to put yourself now in the shoes of those that really believe this. You'll be very popular in the world, won't you? Will you? No. You're a stick in the mud. That's what you are. And they will hate you. They will hate you. For this reason alone. Because this whole mindset is based on Greek and Roman philosophy. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Participation in social life. Authority. Would you like to know the source? Vatican.va. The official source of the Vatican. Every human community needs an authority to govern it. Oh, how, we, how stupid were we to ask for a king? We got one. The foundation of such authority lies in human nature. <laughs> this is fascinating stuff. Common good presupposes respect for the person as such in the name of the common good. You may only respect the person in the name of the common good. In particular, the common good resides in the conditions for the exercise of the natural freedoms indispensable for the development of human vocation, such as the right to act according to a sound norm of conscience and to safeguard privacy and rightful freedom also in the matters of religion. Let me read that again. Freedoms indispensable for the development of the human vocation, such as the right to act according to the sound norm of conscience. Who defines the sound norm of conscience? Not God. Greek philosophy and Roman power. But it should be made accessible to each what is needed to lead a truly human life. There we have it again. It appears over and over again to lead a truly human life. The common good requires peace. You get it? Do we have peace at the moment? 
No. Are you being driven almost insane by the chaos? So what do we need? Common good. That'll solve it. That is the stability and security of a just order. It presupposes that authority should ensure by morally acceptable means the security of society and its members. A common good which permits it to be recognized as such, it is in the political community that its most complete realization is found. It is the role of the state to defend, promote the common good of civil society, its citizens, and intermediate bodies. And there must be a what kind of common good? A universal common good. This is global. Every nation, tribe, people, how many will worship the beast? All will worship the beast. Is the turmoil only in the United States and America? Is the turmoil only in South Africa? Is it only in Europe? Is it only in France? Is it only in Germany? Is it only in Ukraine? Is it only in China? Is it only in Japan? Is it only in Korea? Where is it? Is it only in Afghanistan? Is it only in Pakistan? Is it only... I can go on and on. Isn't it everywhere chaotic? So don't we need a global common good to end this senseless nonsense? So it is necessary that all participate, each according to his position and role in promoting the common good. All of us. As with any ethical obligation, the participation of all in realizing the common goods calls for a continually renewed conversion of the social partners. Everybody. Nobody is going to get past this one. Nobody. The political community and the public authority are based on human nature. Thank you for defining that for me. What is good is, is based on human nature. Who said that in Genesis? Who decides what is good for you? You will be able to say what is good and what is evil. It resides in human nature, not in God. This is dragon religion. And they worship the dragon. That's what the Bible says. They worship the beast by obeying him. And by obeying the beast, they are obeying the whom? The dragon. They're the worshipping Satan. The Vatican is an organization that worships Satan. I know it sounds harsh, but the reality is that that is what the Bible is saying. The diversity of political regimes is legitimate, provided they contribute to the good of the community. Everything, even the state, must be subject to the common good. Now let's ask this gentleman from the Jesuits what he thinks about these things. While well, he writes in Introducing Theologies of Religion, for Jesus, the spirit-filled prophet, excuse me, Mr. Jesuit, you call yourself the Society of Jesus, and you write for Jesus, the spirit-filled prophet, the focus of his life and relationships was the reign of God. That meant that he was not, as his followers have often been, church-centered. Did you know that? It was not church centers. On this rock I will build my social society. It was not church centered. His primary concern was not to increase membership of his own movement or community. Rather it was to transform people's hearts so as to transform their society. <laughs> 